Hello, Familia. So I have um, lots of good scripture for you today, again today. So I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. Um, we'll start with prayer. Oh, dear Lord, Heavenly Father, I just am in awe of your beauty and your love and your mercy and your grace. And I'm just so grateful for your truth. And that is all in love, Lord, Heavenly Father. I just adore that about you. I love that you're showing us more and more daily just how beautiful you are and how much you love us and how much you care and how much um, you're worthy of our trust and you're worthy of giving over everything that we have because you're the one that gave it to us. And so, Lord, thank you. Lord, bless your name. May, you, may your name be kept holy for our God. May thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Father God, give us this day our daily bread. And please forgive us our trespasses, Father God. And, and lead us away from all of our temptations that lead us to them, Father God. And I just ask that you help us to also forgive, Father God, those who sin against us. Help us, Father God, to love and be merciful and gracious and to forgive as you have mercifully and graciously loved and forgiven us. All in the mighty name of Jesus, I ask for your help, Father God. And I thank you that I know that that is a, a prayer that I can count on being answered. Um, glory be to God. Thank you for that, Lord. Lord, Heavenly Father, as I said, please lead us away from all temptation that that causes us to sin against you and to sin against others, Father God. And deliver us from all evil, Father God, because I know that is your will. I know it is your desire that all come to the full knowledge of the truth, Father God. And I agree. I wholeheartedly, with everything that your Holy Spirit has given me, I agree. In Jesus' name, I agree. I want all to be delivered and to come to the full knowledge of the truth. In the mighty name of Jesus, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Hallelujah and amen. Okay, guys, so... Um, we're going to start off with um, John chapter 1, verse 29. It says uh, this, The next day, Yohanan, uh, this is John, saw Yeshua coming toward him and said, Look, God's Lamb, the one who is taking away the sins of the world. He just takes them away. Glory be to God. And, and kind of the theme of today is all, well, it's the theme of every day, but, you know, um, is all are one in Messiah. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 through, let's see, 29, it says, For in union with the Messiah, you are all children of God through this trusting faithfulness. That's why the work of God is to trust. It's, and continuing in verse 27, it says, Because as many of you as were immersed into the Messiah have clothed yourselves with the Messiah, in whom there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave, nor free man, neither male nor female, for in union with the Messiah, Yeshua, you are all one. Also, if you belong to the Messiah, you are seed of Abraham and heirs according to the promise. Glory be to God. And so I love that he's given us that freedom. And I love for me personally as a woman, and so if you're a woman, maybe you could, you know, glean a lot of things from this, but also as, you know, our fellow brothers too can, can see, yes, women are, you know, in the Bible, you know, we are the, the um, weaker vessel. However, in Messiah, there is no male or female. There's no free or slave. It's all one in Messiah. Glory be to God. And it says, um, you are all one, and continuing in verse 29, it says also, if you belong to the Messiah, you are seed of Abraham and heirs according to the promise. And so you receive everything. It's, it, all the promises that he made to Abraham are yes and amen. In Yeshua Messiah, we can't just claim them for ourselves. Um, there's, there's a process. And I don't know your heart, and I don't know your life, and I don't know your process. I know mine, and I know what he's given me, and that's why I share, because I believe that there's many more out there. If if it's not the exact situation, then it, I don't think it really matters. I think the experience 
and the loneliness and the feeling left out and the feeling rejected and the feelings of not ever going to be good enough and, you know, just I could go on and on, you know, that weigh us down and can make it, make it hard for us to believe these things. But I can tell you, as someone, I can testify. I was the biggest worrier, <laughs> my health, you know, how, what I was going to eat, you know, how I was going to eat. Am I going to get to eat today? I mean, even if I have medicine, am I going to be nauseous anyways? <laughs> you know, um, living on, you know, in extreme poverty, living so far below the poverty line for well over a decade now. Um, I was constantly worried about money and how I was going to have a roof over my head. And, and he saved me from all of that. Glory be to God, he saved me from that. And don't don't you think though for one second that the dead man doesn't want to come out and and the, and you know that evil desires inside of me that make myself a priority and make you know my health a priority and make everything else a priority besides God. Don't you think for one second that that my own evil desires aren't warring against me? But he really does. When he says he offers you a way out and that he he warns you. If we're paying attention, he, he does, <laughs> he does, he, he warns us and he, he gives us, I don't know how it works. I have no idea. Like sometimes it comes from a person and something they said I can use a week later for a temptation or, or, you know, a scripture that he gave me somehow inexplicably that day I was able to use it or a year later even, um, and so I just am pointing that out to you so that way to open up your eyes and your mind by power of Holy Spirit. I can't do it, but I'm praying that he will by sharing um, because our testimony in the blood, those are our witnesses. Glory be to God. Um, in John chapter 13, so back to the text in verse 35, it says, everyone will know that you are my Talmudim by the fact that you have love for one another. And so I believe that's part of the reason that I want to say the church, but churches are having issues um, within and out and, and why, you know, Christians are, are persecuted and hated. And, and yes, there is a part of that that is, you know, part of, you know, I mean, it's all got part of God's plan, but I guess my point is, is that if we were to live as the the followers did in Acts. I just wonder how many more, if we couldn't have, you know, outdo Peter in the 3,000 in one day and do millions in one day. I don't know. I mean, only God knows, but I believe it's possible because our God is the God of impossible. Um, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 um, through 20, he just reminded me of the Gideon call, you know, about he purposely made them less. <laughs> I love it. So that way he could get all the glory. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17, 17 through 20, it says, and I'm actually going to go into the text for this one as well, because I don't have all the scriptures written down. I just have, yes, therefore, if anyone is united with the Messiah, he is a new creation. The old has passed. Look what has come. It's fresh, fresh and new. So let me go ahead and go to that text, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, 17 through 20 was the verses. And actually, I'm going to start at 16 because it's just where it starts in that section. It says, From now on, then, we do not know anyone in a purely human way. Even if we have known Christ in a purely human way, yet now we no longer know him in this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and look, new things have come. Everything is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. He just gave us this ministry. It's beautiful. And he prepared us for it with everything. It says that is in Christ. God was reconciling the world to himself. He came for the world. I love that. Not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for trusting us, wretched humans. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, certain that God is appealing 
But who was? I am very certain. All, with all I got. We plead on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us. So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He wants to make us holy and pure. And, and perfect, just as his son is perfect, as just a gift. He delights in giving us the kingdom. What? He's up there rejoicing over us. I know, I know, it blows my mind too, fam. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing that he's given me this gift of faith. Because for me, outside of Jesus himself, um, faith is one of the next best gifts that I've ever been given by God. Because I didn't. <laughs> I've, I've had all the different faiths. I've had negative faith. I've had cursing God faith. I've had self-righteous faith. I've had lukewarm faith. I've had cold faith. I've had hot faith. I've had all the faiths. Now that he's brought me, or, no, not brought me, he's bringing me more and more daily into union with him, the better and easier and more beautiful life is for me personally. And the more I want to share, if I'm honest, um, in Acts chapter one, verses 14, um, actually I'm going to start in 12 because, um, it talks about all the people in Jerusalem. It says, then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called the Mount of Olives. That's where Jesus hung out too. It says, which is near Jerusalem, a, a day, a day of Shabbat's journey away. When they arrived, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. All these were continually not united in prayer, along with the woman, women, <clears throat> excuse me, including Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. I love that. Um, that they were all continually united in prayer. United. One spirit. Glory be to God. Um, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, I'll go to that too. It says, But I tell you that anyone who nurses anger against his brother will be subject to judgment. Um, and so that's why we're to love our brothers and we're to keep loving our brothers. I am going to go to that. Um, Matthew chapter 5. And I just wrote down the one verse. But let's see whatever the spirit says. In Jesus' name to go. Um, it says, but I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. And whoever says to his brother, fool, will be subject to the Sanhedrin. But whoever says, you moron, will be subject to hellfire. So if you are offering your gift on the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled with your brother and then come and offer your gift. Reach a settlement quickly with your adversary while you're on the way with him, or your adversary will hand you over to the judge, the judge, the officer, and you will be thrown into prison. I assure you, you will never get out of there until you have paid the last penny. And why would you want to go, to, you know, go that route? <laughs> you know, I mean, I know that I suppose there's, you know, he says there's going to be that it was planned, you know, um, I guess that was in the daily bread and one of the scriptures that's talked about, it was planned that they would fall, you know, and, but I still have hope because <laughs> our God is the God of impossible in Ephesians chapter four. I'm trying to find it, but it talks about this as well. And I have 31 and 32 is the scriptures. And actually, I'm going to start at 20. It says, but that is not how you learned about the Messiah. Assuming you heard about him and were taught by him, you get taught by God, not by anybody else, not by me. Glory be to God. Because the truth is in Jesus. You took off your former way of life, the old self, that is corrupted by deceit, deceitful desires. You are being renewed in the spirit of your mind. You put on the new self, the new one create the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of the truth. Since you put away lying, speak the truth each one to his neighbor, because we are members of one another. Be angry and don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger and don't give the devil an opportunity. 
The thief must no longer steal. Instead, he must do honest work with his own hands so that he has something to share with anyone in need. And that's what I love. He does. He prepares us. No foul language is to come from your mouth, but only what is good for building someone up, someone in need, so that it gives grace to those who hear. And it says, don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed by him for the day of redemption. All bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting, and slander must be removed from you, along with all malice, and be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another just as God has also forgiven you in Christ. And I know it's hard. I know, I know for me that it's hard. Um, I also wrote down those um, same verses. Uh, let's see. Oh, actually, I see what I did here. So I decided to look up some of those words. Forgive me. Sometimes I have to look at my notes and the Holy Spirit's got to prompt me. <laughs> um, so if you're ever wondering, that's, that's what's happening um, for the most part. Um, I looked up spitefulness. Because it says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, violent assertiveness, and slander, along with all spitefulness. And, you know, in verse 29, it says, let no harmful language come from your mouth, only good words that are helpful in meeting the need, words that will benefit those who hear them. Don't cause grief to God's Ruach HaKadosh, for he has stamped you as his property until the day of final redemption. It says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, violent assertiveness, and slander, along with all spitefulness. And what, you know, I found was a lot of stuff. It says, having or showing a desire to hurt, um, anger, or um, defeat someone. Having anger against someone or, you know, having the desire to defeat someone. It's malicious ill will, overly critical and dismissive, engaging in passive aggressive behavior, expressing their own unresolved anger or frustration, feeling threatened or insecure, seeking attention or control in their relationships or social interactions, um, wanting to annoy, upset, or hurt another, especially in a small way because you feel angry toward them. So we've all, we've all done that, all of us. And I can tell you God can purge it out of you. I don't know how long in your journey. I don't know how long in my own journey um, when he's going to purge me of all of my disgusting ways, but I know he is more and more every day. The more he's pointing it out to me, I just give it to him because I, what, I just, I, it's gotten to the point where there's many prayers that I pray. I don't know what you want me to do with this. Show me. I, I, I know what you're trying to say, but how do I say it? <laughs> I don't know how, or, you know, with, you know, convictions and stuff, you know, like, okay, yes. I agree. I want to be rid of that too, Father God. Show me. <laughs> You're going to have to show me because I have no idea. Without, you know, literally just confessing what we already know and what he already knows as well. Um, and I wrote down the um, verse 32 as well in the Jewish translation. It says, instead be kind to each other, tender hearted. And forgive each other, just as in the Messiah God, in the Messiah, God has also forgiven you. So it's in the Messiah, you know, we have to be in him to receive the forgiveness. And because it's a free gift, all we have to do is just say, okay, we just have to admit the truth. We cannot save ourselves. There's nothing we could ever do. There's not, I mean, we could, we could work for 10,000 years in the name of Jesus and still not pay back what he's done for us. So that's my whole point is I'm hoping to get us all to stop trying, including myself. <laughs> In Psalm chapter 2, verse 11, it says, Serve Adonai with fear. Rejoice, but with trembling. So we get the joy and we get the shalom, but we do it, you know, knowing that it could be, you know, the person, we need to be in fear of the one person that can take. The world can't and nobody in it can and you know nothing can separate us from his love but you know it if david says 
please don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. It, it Logic says that he could take it away. And so, you know, when we're convicted, get rid of it. Give it to him immediately. I, you know, um, I don't know what that process looks for you, but I can tell you, just get rid of it. Admit it. Admit it. Um, sincerely. Because he'll know. I mean, and if you can't, ask for help. Ask for help. He, he won't deny you. If you're, if you're asking for help to agree with his truth, I can confidently say he's going to help you. I can confidently say that. In Psalm, verse 139, 23, and 24, it says, Examine me, God. This is why I know. I love, I couldn't have timed that better. It says, Examine me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is in me any hurtful way. And lead me along the eternal way. I just gave you scripture for that too. Like I just said it, but then he's like, okay, but here's my words. Psalm, I'm going to tell you that again. One, Psalm 139, 23 through 24. Psalm 51 um, is another good one um, for repentance and, and for asking God to, to cleanse you. Um, Isaiah chapter 53, I'm actually going to go to that um, one in the text. Um let me find my book here, Isaiah 53, but I wrote down verse 5. But he was wounded because of our crimes, crushed because of our sins. The disciplining that makes us whole, the disciplining that makes us full of shalom, because that's what shalom is, it's more than peace, it's completeness, it's wholeness, fell on him. The requirements and everything that needed to, to give us full reconciliation and shalom and joy in the Lord and the fear of the Lord, <clears throat> and the rest, all of it's fallen on him. It, he took care of it. It's respond, he's resp he was responsible. It's finished. And by his bruises, stripes, or wounds, we are healed. By them we are healed. Um, Isaiah chapter 53. It's such a good verse because uh, our good scripture. I mean, it all is, but I really... For me personally, it made me relate to the Messiah on the level that I was unable to, of course, in my own, and recognize that he went through way more than ever I could imagine, and he didn't even deserve it, and I am the one that does. And so it gives, just, just gives you this beautiful perspective of, yeah, grief over our own sins, but then joy over the forgiveness that's freely given to a humble heart. <clears throat> and so in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53, it says this, Who has believed what we have heard? And who has the arm of the Lord been revealed to? He grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him. No appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. Jesus knows what sickness was. That really, I'm about to cry because I'm not alone in my sickness and neither are you. No matter what that look, sickness looks like, it doesn't have to look like mine. It says he was like someone people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. Yet he himself for our sicknesses, and he carried our pains. But we, in turn, regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our transgressions, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our shalom was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, Yet he did not open his mouth, like a lamb led to the slaughter, and sh like a sheep silent before her shearers. He did not open his mouth. He was taken away because of oppression and judgment. Who considered his faith? I can't imagine. What the triune God experienced. For he was cut off from the land of the living, 
He was struck because of my people's rebellion. They made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man at his death. Although he had done no violence and had not spoken deceitfully, even though he was perfect, he was per you're still perfect, Yeshua. He says, yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. Yeah, I'm sure it hurt, but he was also pleased. It's the beauty of it. Because he saw the, the end of it. That's why it's pleasing to be crushed now. Because I'd rather be crushed now in the land of the living than, <clears throat> you know, my soul be for eternity. <laughs> it says, when you make him a restitution offering, he will see his seed. He will prolong his days. And by his hand, the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. He will see see it out of his anguish and he will be satisfied with his knowledge my righteous servant will justify many and he will carry their iniquities he carries our iniquities he carries our sins he carried them on his body thank you jesus can't even <sighs> beautiful it says therefore i will give him the many as a portion that's why we're people of God's possession. Because Jesus earned it. <laughs> he earned it. Um, it says, therefore I will give him the many as a portion, and he will receive the mightiest spoil. I believe that's why he says we must endure. It says, because he submitted himself to death and was counted among the rebels, yet he bore the sin of many and interceded for the rebels. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Um, and a little bit earlier in that book of Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 18, I wrote it down in the, um, I wrote that verse down in the Jewish translation, but I'm actually going to go to the text as well since we're already in the book of Isaiah. Let's get there one of these days. <laughs> I love our God and his timing, though, because, you know, um, just when we think, oh, you know, I'm going too slow or, you know, or this isn't right or this didn't work out right. He shows me like, oh, that was why. It, like, wow, I couldn't even have planned to be slow or planned to be in that. He's just so good, y'all. Our God is so good. Isaiah 1. Chapter 8, or verse 18, rather, it says this. So I'm going to start at 16, the purification of Jerusalem. It says, wash yourselves, cleanse yourselves, remove your evil deeds from my sight. Stop doing evil, learn to do what is good. Seek justice, correct the oppressor, oppressor. defend the rights of the fatherless, plead the widow's case, or plead the widow's cause, rather. It says, come. Let us discuss this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they will be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good things of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And so, um, and says, um, I guess it's really not that much different in the Jewish text. It just says, come now, it says Adonai, let's talk this over together. Even if your sins are like scarlet, they will be white as snow. Even if they are red as crimson, they will be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the Lord, <coughs> eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be eaten by the sword, for the mouth of Adonai has spoken. And remember, the sword comes out of his mouth. And the sword is also the word of truth. And so the sword could be just truth coming at your way and you're not wanting to hear it. And I get it. You don't want to hear it, do we? Um, in Ephesians chapter 13, 2, 13 through, let's see, I believe I went through verse 17. It says this, but now, so I don't want you to worry though. Like it says, if you're willing and obedient, well, we can't on our own. And so this is the good news. I mean, further good news, I should say. 
says, But now you who were once far off have been brought near through the shedding of the Messiah's blood. So just him shedding his blood, if you're really far away from, you know, God, <clears throat> which we all are before Jesus, um, you're already brought near. Just by him shedding his blood, you're brought near through the shedding of the Messiah's blood. For he himself is our shalom. He's our peace. He has made us both one. He has made us both one and has broken down the mechitza, the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility or of spiritual antagonism between us, the Jews, and the Gentiles. So the there was an, you know, an, an enmity in between the Jewish people and the Gentiles. And that was basically your Gentile, if you didn't, if you weren't Jewish and you didn't believe in the Jewish faith, and that goes for now too, you were a Gentile. And so he destroyed that. There's no longer any barrier there. It, it's done. He said it was finished. And so I'll continue in the text. It says, <clears throat> by destroying his own body, the enmity occasioned by the Torah with its commands set forth in the form of ordinances. He did this in order to create in union with himself from the two groups a single new humanity. Remember I was just talking about no male or female, free or slave, no Jew or Gentile, a new humanity. And thus make shalom and in order to be re reconciled to God, a path and a single, or both, <laughs> in order to reconcile to God both in a single body by being executed. I'm going to read that again. He did this in order to create in union with himself from the two groups a single new humanity and thus make shalom and in order to be to reconcile to God both in a single body by being executed on the stake <clears throat> as a criminal and thus in himself killing the enmity. And so we can create it, though. We can create our own divisions and and our own rules and our own things. But it's still it's still God. We can create all these our hearts can lie to us all we want, and we can delude ourselves all we want. But it's still God's truth is still going to be God's truth. Um, <clears throat> and so I looked up um, en en enmity as well, and it says this. The state or feeling of being actively opposed or hostile to someone or something. It's also deep-rooted hate, hatred. It also can be friendship with the world is also enmity with God. That's in James 4.4 4 and 1 John 2.15 and 16. In the mind of the flesh is enmity against God. It's in Romans 8.7. Either overt or concealed. So it can be out there in the open or it can be concealed. Um, the law of Torah of commandments in ordinances or dogma that separates law or separates Jews and Gentiles, meaning the oral tra traditions that separate us, the things that we make up ourselves that are not written down in the word of God. That is what he's talking about. We, that is what is, you know, causing us not to be able to be reconciled to God and is, and, is, and why we're not allowed to have, the peace and the shalom. It's because we're always constantly warring against the world. <clears throat> and I'll tell you what my personal battle was once I've been saved. You know, you get, we get this Messiah complex because we realize that we could be made perfect in Jesus and he says we can do greater things than him. And so then we think, oh, well, then I can just like tell people the truth and they're going to know and it's going to be awesome and... It's just not, it's not my timing. It's not my way. It's not my design. I can't know what God has planned before all time unless he tells me. And that's why he says, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough trouble of its own. And so that is where I rest. I, I work for today and, you know, um, I don't worry about tomorrow. And that's my power of Holy Spirit. That's nothing to do with me. Um, I'm going to continue before I go to those other scriptures in verse 17 of um, Ephesians chapter 2. It says this, Also, when he came, he announced as good news to you far off, 
So if you're far, he's announcing good news to you. And shalom and completeness and hopeless to those nearby. News that through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. By him, Jews, Gentiles, no matter who you are, in union with Messiah, you have access to God. God the Father. Who Jesus says is the only one that's good and is greater than him. And so... If Jesus is saying that, you know, he's not good and he was perfect. And if he's saying that um, the father is greater than him, then who are we to say anything else? We can't. We just can't. Um, in James chapter 4, 4, I'm going to go to that. Like I said, I wanted to, oops, my Bible fall apart, y'all. <laughs> Glory be to God. It's the only one that's fallen apart in a righteous way. I'll tell you that much. So you... Confession time, Familia. I can't tell you how many... When I used to be a smoker, a cigarette smoker, and, um, you know, I roll joints to, you know, I, the Book of Mormon and the Bible. I have definitely used it as rolling paper. gross now that I know all I know about the word that it was Jesus and I was doing that thank God for mercy thank you God for mercy because <laughs> that was an awful wretched thing for me to do um, James 4.4 4, um, says adulteresses don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God so whoever wants to be the world's friend becomes God en God's enemy. It says, or do you think it's without reason? The scripture says that the spirit who lives in us yearns jealously, but he gives greater grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble, knowing 24-7 that you need a savior and that it's daily and that you, yeah, you were saved at once, but it, it's, it's our daily bread. He says, therefore, submit to God, but resist the devil resist the lies in your own heart and he will flee from you draw near to God and see that's the thing if we resist these things inside he's not that's not going to flee from us God's got to do that it says draw near to God and he will draw near to you cleanse your hands sinners and purify your hearts double-minded people it says be miserable and mourn and weep your laughter must change to mourning and your joy to sorrow Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. It says, don't criticize one another, brothers. He who criticizes a brother or judges his brother, criticizes the law, judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. There's one lawgiver and judge who's able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? It says, come now. I love how he just brought me to that scripture I was just talking about. Glory be to God. <laughs> I love you, Lord. <laughs> Let's continue with verse 13. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will travel to such and such a city and spend a year there and do business and make a profit. You don't even know what tomorrow will bring, what your life will be. For you are like smoke that appears for a little while then vanishes. It says instead, you should say if the Lord wills, we will live. And do this or that. But as it is, you who boast in, but as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So it is sin for the person who knows what to do, knows to do what is good and doesn't do it. Um, I'm afraid to even attempt to read that. <laughs> I almost want, I almost didn't want to because I thought, oh, is that me? What do you, you know? And those are false motives, but no, he's, nope. I, I'm pretty sure I can keep going. Um, James chapter 5. Come now, you rich people. Weep and wail over the miseries that are coming on you. Your wealth is ruined and your clothes are moth-eaten. Your silver and gold are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you. And will eat your flesh like fire. You stored up treasure in the last days. We're not supposed to store up treasure here. We're not supposed to have a bunch of stuff here. It says, look, 
The pay that you withheld from the workers who reaped your fields cries out, and the outcry of the harvesters has reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived luxuriously on the land and have indulged yourselves. You have fattened your hearts for the day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the righteous man. He does not resist you. And remember, we can murder by just having angry in our heart, or anger in our heart, rather. Um, continue verse 7. Therefore, brothers, familia, be patient until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and is patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. You must also be patient. Strengthen your hearts because the Lord's coming is near and he'll help you. In his weakness, or sorry, in our weaknesses, he is made strong. Brothers, do not complain about one another so that you will not be judged. Look, the judge stands at the door. Brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the Lord's name as an example of suffering and patience. Paul and Job, <laughs> then my dudes, Jesus has used them powerfully. Thank you, Jesus. See, we count as blessed those who have endured. So we count as blessed those who have endured. You have heard of Job's endurance. <laughs> I forgot about this part. You have heard of Job's endurance and have seen the outcome from the Lord. <laughs> the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Now, above all, my brothers, familia, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. Your yes must be yes and your no must be no, so that you won't follow, fall under judgment. Is anyone among you suffering? He should pray. Is anyone cheerful? He should sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church and they should pray over him after anointing him with olive oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick person and the Lord will restore him to health. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. That's why I just did. <laughs> and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The urgent request of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, yet he prayed earnestly that it would it, didn't, it would not rain, rather. And for three years and six months, it did not rain in the land. Then he prayed again in the sky, gave rain, and the land produced its fruit. My brothers, if any among you strays from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that whoever turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save his life from death and cover a multitude of sins. God says love. The command to love covers the multitude of sins. So, um, in Hebrews uh, chapter 4, 14 through 16, it says this. Therefore, since we have a great Kohen Gadol, who, the great high priest, who has passed through the highest heaven, Yeshua, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we acknowledge as true. For we do not have a Kohen Gadol unable to empathize with our weaknesses. He knows. He knows it all. Since in every respect he was tempted, just as we were. The only difference being that he did not sin. And so he knows how to do it without sinning. We don't. We can't. And so we get, we get, it's a free gift we get to learn from, from the master. Glory be to God. Oh, glory be to God. <laughs> says, Therefore, let us confidently approach the throne from which God gives grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. I love that. We just have to approach him. Confidently knowing that and expecting mercy and goodness to follow you and to pursue you. And he gave me um, his glory as a rear guard. I'm going to go ahead and give that to you. As a, a, it was freely given to me, and so I freely dish it out to you, Familia. Enjoy. <laughs> I mean, what better rear guard could you possibly have than the glory of God? If you're, if you're not familiar, you know, with, you know, fighting or football, rear guard basically is the dude that's got your back or dudes or, you know, whoever it is. But in this case, it's God. And, and that's the best one we could possibly have. We won't, we don't want any other rear guard but him and his glory. First um, John chapter one, verses eight through 10, it says, if we claim not to have sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. 
If we acknowledge our sins, then since he is trustworthy and just, he will forgive them and purify us from all wrongdoing. If we claim we have not been sinning, we are making him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Um, I love that though. That he, we just got to confess. We confess. And he's trustworthy and just to forgive us. Um, in 1 Corinthians 3, I only wrote down a, for a few verses. It's 7 through 9. Um, but, so I'm going to go to the text um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But um, I like to compare the text. So I'm going to try and, by power of Holy Spirit, accomplish that task. <laughs> um in Jesus' name. <laughs> um, let's see. We're going to start, though. This one. It says, actually, no, I'm going to start at the beginning. It says, brothers, familia, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as babies in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, because you were not yet ready for it. In fact, you are still not ready, because you are still fleshly. For since there is envy and strife among you, are you not fleshly and living like unbelievers? For whenever someone says, I'm with Paul, and another, I'm with Apollos, are you not unspiritual people? As I was reading that, I kept hearing, I'm with this church, I'm with this church, I'm with this church share that with you. It says, what then is Apollos, or that church? And what is Paul, that church? They are servants through whom you believed, and each has the role the Lord has given. I planted Apollos, I planted Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. Nothing. <laughs> I just am a Fellow servant, fellow servant, just doing his, his her duty, and I'm grateful that I get to do it in joy and in shalom when I get to enjoy it. That's all glory be to God. I love that. It says, um, so then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Now the one planting and the one watering are one in purpose, and each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's co-workers. I love that. You are God's field, God's building. Isn't that exciting? We don't have to go to that job and go work with those co-workers. We can have God and his people as our co-workers. Hallelujah. <laughs> what freedom from the world is that? That's true freedom, Familia. It says, according to God's grace that was given to me, I have laid a foundation as a skilled master builder and another builds on it, but each one must be careful how he builds it. For no one can lay any other foundation than what has been laid down. That foundation is Jesus Christ and his gospel, his truth. If anyone builds on that foundation with gold or silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become obvious, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. Fire will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work that he has built survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, it will be lost, but he will be saved. Yet it will be like an escape through fire. You're going to come out smelling like smoke. You're not going to be... Um, keep thinking Daniel, but it's not. It's Azariah, Mishael, and um, Lord have mercy, I can't remember, but the three Hebrew boys, you know, they didn't come out smelling like anything. But it's saying here that if, you know, you go into the fire, you can come out smelling like smoke, you'll be saved, but your reward and everything, you know, that you worked for will be burned up. And nobody wants that, especially for the ones that are supposed to last a lifetime. Or, you know, last forever, rather. That will never perish. Continuing in verse 18, or 17. Oh, I forgive me. 16. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Thank you, Holy Spirit. It says, don't you yourselves know that you are God's sanctuary and that the Spirit of God lives in you? If anyone destroys God's sanctuary, God will destroy him. For God's sanctuary is holy and that is what you are. It says, no one should deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks he is wise in this age, he must become foolish so that he can become wise. 
For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, since it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise are meaningless. He had to teach me that one quite a bit. I'm sorry, Father. <laughs> so no one should boast in human leaders, for everything is yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, everything is yours. You belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. And it goes into being a faithful manager. And I think since I only have a few more um, scriptures left, I'm going to go ahead and read it. It says, a person should consider us in this way, as servants of Christ and managers of God's mysteries. In this regard, is it, it is expected of managers that each one of them be found faithful. It is of little importance to me that I should be evaluated by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even evaluate myself. For I'm not conscious of anything against myself, but I'm not justified by this. Thank God we're not. Thank God we're not. Because we can justify ourselves and lie to ourselves all day long. I did it for almost 40 years, and I didn't, I didn't even come close to the truth. I wasn't even anywhere near it that I thought in my brain. But it turns out my being in the furnace was bringing me closer. It says, the one who evaluates me is the Lord. Therefore, don't judge anything prematurely before the Lord comes, who will both bring to light what is hidden in darkness and reveal the intentions of the heart. And then praise will come to each one in the, to each one from God. Um, love that. In First Corinthians, so we're still in that same book in First Corinthians chapter twelve. I think I just, yeah. And this is the diversity of the spiritual or diversity of spiritual gifts. It says now concerning as I said, my Bible's falling apart, y'all. It's <laughs> a good sign. Um, it says now concerning what comes from the Spirit, brothers, I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you used to be led off to the to the idols that could not speak. Therefore, I am informing you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is cursed. He's not. He's my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. He is the Son of God. I believe 100%. And that's by the grace and mercy, love of God, and not in my own. Nothing. Zilch. Below zero. Me. <laughs> There's, it's negative 50% me in this. Negative. In Jesus' name, let it be so. It says, now there are different gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different ministries, but the same Lord. And there are different activities, but the same God activates each gift in each person. A demonstration of the Spirit is given to each person to produce what is beneficial. To one is given a message of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, a message of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gift of healing. Gifts of healing, rather. By one spirit. To another, the performing of miracles. To another, prophesy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, different kinds of languages. To another, interpretation of languages. But one and the same spirit is active in these, distributing to each person as he wills. So, I love that. You know, I love that each part has a, a place and that, that, that he wants, you, you know, diversity. It's not, we're not supposed to be all clones of each other. Glory be to God. I mean, clones in our, you know, love, mercy and grace, but clones of Jesus, not of anything of this world. It says, continuing in verse 12, it says, For as the body is one and has many parts, and all the parts of the body through many, though many, are one body. So also is Christ, for we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. So the body is not one part, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, in spite of this, it still belongs to the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, in spite of this, it still belongs to the body. Let's see. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed each one of the parts in one body just as he wanted. 
And if they were all the same part, where would the body be? Now there are many parts, yet one body. So the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Or again, the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. But even more, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are necessary. And those parts of the body that we think to be less honorable, we clothe these with greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have, be have a better presentation. But our presentable parts have no need of clothing. Instead, God has put the body together giving greater honor to the less honorable. Glory be to God, so that there would be no division in the body. This is, so there's no division, but that the members, members would have the same concern for each other. So if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. It says, now if you are the body of Christ and an individual members of it, and God has placed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, next miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, managing, various kinds of languages. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all do miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in other languages? Do all interpret? But desire the greater gifts, and I will show you an even better way. And I think that's the end of that one. And it, it goes into chapter 13. Love, um, superior way. And Philippians, and I actually have more scripture on that scripture that I just read for later today. If um, Holy Spirit enables me to be able to record it, um, I'll have that up too. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. says Christian humility it says if then there is any encouragement in Christ if any consolation of love if any fellowship of the spirit if any affection and mercy fulfill my joy by thinking the same way having the same love sharing the same feelings focusing on one goal doing nothing out of rivalry or conceit but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves everyone should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. That's why, that's why I keep praying for not one left. Because if it were me, if I was the one that was never given hope to, I mean. Don't let anybody go behind. Just make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking in the likeness of men. <coughs> Excuse me. And when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death says, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And he goes into make lights of the world. Um, Mark chapter 10, verse 45. I may see and look and see what else um, I can add from the other scripture that I got for today after this. So we'll see just kind of where he God leads me. I'm going to start at 44. It says, They came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho, his disciples and a large crowd, Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, I love that I gave him a name, Bartimaeus, was sitting by the road. When he heard that it was Jesus, the Nazarene, he began to cry out, Son of David, Jesus, have mercy on me. Many people told him to keep quiet, but he was crying out all the more, Have mercy on me, Dave, son of David. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called the blind man and said, Then have courage. Get up. He's calling for you. He threw off his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. He's calling for you, Familia. Get up. <laughs> then Jesus answered him, What do you want me to do for you? 
Rabuni, the blind man told him, I want to see. Go your way, Jesus told him. Your faith has healed you. Immediately, he could see and began to follow him on the road. Immediately. And actually, I didn't even read 45. It says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And so that's what we were sent here to do, is to serve God first, but to serve each other in that same, you know, love and joy and peace and shalom that he gives us. And so... Um, Actually, I think I'm going to split this up into three videos and leave it this one at this. Leave this one here. Um, I just, uh, I'm just really grateful that God has given me this opportunity to be able to share his truth and his love with you. May the Lord bless you and keep you and may he make his face shine upon you in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. I love you. Samaria, and it's because he loved me first. In the mighty name of Jesus, hallelujah and amen.